If you would, please turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And I'm going to read from verse 15 to verse 20, which is the end of the chapter. End of the book. Mark chapter 16, beginning in verse 15. These are the words of Christ. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Uh, I've entitled this, He That Believes, or He That Believeth. Now, this is going to be a little bit odd, even for us, because I do want to start out with this one strange fact. This is a very disputed portion of Scripture. Actually, from Mark, verse, Mark chapter 16, verse 9 to the end, a lot of people think that's not Scripture. They think it's not authentic. Now, there's a reason why they think that. Well, reason number one is because they're wrong. But reason number two is, supposedly... The two oldest whole manuscripts in existence do not have Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. And that's true. Now, it's not the oldest text. It's the oldest manuscript put together as one. It's called the Vaticanus and the Sinatus. And I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail, but I do want to put this out here because some people will run into this. In the NIV, if you've got one, It'll say in the margin, well, actually in the break between verse 8 and verse 9, the two most reliable early script, early testaments or whatever, I think I wrote it down, don't have this section of scripture. Well, I'd agree the two early assemblies of a manuscript don't have it in there, but as to the reliability, that's yeah, not even close. Okay. And it does say that these two codexes, which means they're handwritten, these two codexes are the source for most modern translations. Okay. That's another hint that it's not a good thing, if you really want to know the truth about it. I'm quite certain that's a true statement, and I'm also quite certain it might not be something to be proud of. Martin Luther didn't use it in his German Bible. And the King James Version does not use the Vaticanus or the Sinatus. And there's reasons why. Uh, the Vaticanus is riddled with errors, misspellings, and omissions. I'm not going to go into them, but you can Google it. It'll tell you. And the Sinaiticus is riddled with omissions. And this is the key point. The reason they call it the Vaticanus is it was found in the Vatican, supposedly. The reason they call it the Sinaiticus is because it came from the Sinai region. It's an Alexandrian manuscript. Now, two things you need to know about this. Alexandria was the place of origin. Not the origin of the Bible or anything. The guy named Origen. Now, Origen was infamous. They say famous. I say infamous for taking out of the scriptures whatever he didn't like. And uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica had a really nice statement about Origen. It says, everything in Origen's theology ultimately turns upon the goodness of God and the freedom of the creature. <laughs> and if you know the truth, that tells you exactly everything you need to know about Origen. Stay away from him. 
Now, that's not to say there's not a lot of truth in other versions, but I'll go with this one. I will. I'll go with the Texas Receptus to receive text over the Vaticanus or the Sinaiticus any day of the week. It does not hurt sometimes to use them for contrast or for comparison. I do do that. I've got different Bible versions on my program on my computer. I've got one thing that's got four versions in it. But they leave this out. And that's wrong. There is one fellow who was fairly honest about it. And this is what he said. One man, he summed it up this way. While the added ending offers no new information, nor does it... Nor does it contradict previous revealed events and or doctrine. Then he says both the external and the internal evidence make it quite certain that Mark didn't write it. Well, I'll give him the first part. It's true. That's the first part. Mark 9 to 20 is true as the rest of the scriptures. Now, whether Mark wrote it or not, I don't know. He could have added it on later himself when he was older and writing a little differently. They seem to not take that into account. There were two guys that wrote the book of Isaiah. Isaiah and Deutero-Isaiah. They don't understand. If you look at things I wrote when I was a young man, and you look at things that I write now, there's a world of difference. My word choice is different everything. My grammar, my sentence structure is sometimes worse. I can't help it. I use my own shorthand. But here's the thing. This is the truth of God in this book. So, what does it say? That was basically kind of introduction and I wanted to say it. But verse 15, these are the words of Christ. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is called by some the Great Commission. And I really don't have a problem with that. Because it's what Christ told us to do. Now, he is speaking directly here to the eleven. That's who he's speaking to, the 11. Now, who are the 11? Well, the easiest way to figure that out is the 12 minus Judas. That's what it is. It's the 11 apostles because Judas is gone. This is Christ after his resurrection speaking to his disciples before his ascension. He upbraided them in verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, and they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he had risen, before the eleven had seen him. They believe now. But he did, didn't believe in his resurrection before he showed himself to them. And he upbraided them for that. But what he's saying here, the first word he says is go. And the second word is ye. Go ye. You're going to go where God wants you to go. You're going to be where God wants you to be. Now how you get there is up to him. He'll see to it that you go if you are to go. But this is the order he gave to these 11. Go ye, what, into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. This is a matter of vocation. This is a matter of their job. And going and preaching the gospel is a result of the vocation, the calling that these men were called to. Christ gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. This is the vocation. 
everything else to this is secondary. This is number one. Christ said it first because it is number one. Go and preach the gospel. Everything else is secondary to preaching the word of Christ. We do other things here. But it revolves around, hopefully it revolves around preaching the word of Christ. Neil, that was just mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> Everything is secondary to this. Now, we don't do a lot of things other places do. And I'm not here to talk about them. But this is the whole point. If whatever you're doing is not revolving around the preaching of the gospel and the expounding, expanding of the gospel, it's not part of the primary concern. It's secondary at best, tertiary at worst, and useless for a lot of people. This is the job of the pastor and the teacher, the evangelist and the prophet and the apostles. That's where it started from. The apostles are where we get our doctrine from. It's called the apostolic doctrine for a reason. This is what they said. This is what they wrote down. And this is what we preach. And it is the primary, primary thing for the assembly of the saints is the preaching of the gospel. Is to preach it and to hear it. That's primary. But you also have to make sure it's the gospel of Christ that is preached. Because Jesus said it. Preach the gospel. He didn't say preach a gospel. He didn't preach one of the gospels. He didn't say preach your gospel. Although it is yours. Paul called it my gospel. But Paul also called it the gospel of Christ. The gospel of his dear son. The gospel of God. There's only one gospel. You got to make sure it's the only one gospel that you're preaching. And that actually goes, you got to make sure it's only the one gospel that you are hearing. See, that's on you. It's on me when I'm sitting down there listening to Walter. It's on Walter while he's sitting here listening to me. This is for everyone. Beloved, try the spirits. That's what he said. Try the spirits. To see whether or not they are telling the truth about God. Because there are many false prophets. John wrote that about 2,000 years ago. I think there's a lot more now. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Because there are false prophets and there have always been false prophets. Look in the Old Testament. There were those who said they were speaking for God and they weren't. There were those who spoke contrary to the prophets. Which are written in here. I don't know how many thousands of years ago that was. Man has not changed. We are to preach the gospel. And the gospel, I can tell you this, is what Walter's been preaching the last few weeks. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That's good news. That's good news. Jesus Christ came to call sinners to repentance. That's good news. You notice that the gospel revolves around the name Jesus. It better. It had better, or it ain't the gospel. Amen. Jesus Christ has redeemed sinners. He did that about 2,000 years ago. Amen. The Father and the Son are quickening whom they will. That's the good news. 
Jesus Christ is bringing many sons to glory. That's Hebrews 2 and 10 there. All of our salvation from before the foundation of the world to the inhabitation of the new heaven and the new earth is what? It's the work of God. And it's a part of the gospel of Jesus Christ because he's the one that does it all. The gospel is not the good news that God needs your help. Because that ain't good news. Because God's arm is not short that it cannot save. It's not that he can't save without you reaching up. They sang that song. When he reached down, I reached up. No, no, when he reached down, you was in a pit. And you were so dumb you didn't even know you were in a pit. Well, it's a dead. And now you are to remember the pit from which you digged. You didn't dig your way out. He brought you out. He lifted up the beggar off the dunghill to sit him with princes and kings. And guess what? That beggar is sitting with princes and kings. We were so bad, we didn't even know which way was up. That's right. I reached up when he reached down. I wish, but it ain't so. God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, saves. And he doesn't need man's cooperation or man's help. But he does say this next. After he says, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. There's a result every time the gospel is preached. He that believeth is the first part. This is one of the results of, believe, of preaching the gospel. Those who know Christ will believe the gospel. Those who know Christ believe Christ. Those that believe and are baptized shall be saved. Now just the facts here in this statement, he doesn't tell us how we believe. He doesn't tell us why we believe. He just says he that believes... This is the point here. This is the point he's making. These men, these 11, were to go out and preach. And he that believes shall be saved. What did he say when he was going to see Lazarus? He told Martha. He says, he that lives and believes in me. In me shall never die. Then he asked her, do you believe that? That's the gospel. He that liveth and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe that? Those are his words, not mine. I can say them, I can repeat them with full confidence that they are true because they are the words of the Son of God just as these are here. He that lives in me, lives and believes in me, shall never die. The true gospel is to tell you to believe him. 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 You'll believe the gospel. You'll believe the gospel. But you'll only believe the gospel if you believe him. Him. What did he tell him? He that liveth and believeth, what? In me. In me. Just for a moment, I'm going to turn to John 3, 18. Not 16, 18. And for the reference of some people out there, John 3, 18 comes after John 3, 16, which is also true. Now, I know, I know. We're getting into numerology here. John 3.18 comes after John 3.16 and they'll tell you to read John 3.16 and believe it but they won't tell you to read John 3.18. Yeah. 
He that believeth on him is not condemned. But, ooh, it's, that's a big but too. He that believeth not is condemned already. I wonder why. Keep reading. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You got to believe him in order to believe the gospel. Believing things will never save you. He didn't say he that believes the gospel. He said he that believes. He didn't say he that believes the doctrine. Or the five points of Calvinism. Which are true. I'm not denigrating those. But those don't save you. They're not a proof of salvation either. But you'll believe them if you believe him. <laughs> That's the way it works. If you believe him, you'll know of the doctrine. What's that? That's scripture. If you believe him, you'll know the doctrine. Why? Because he's going to teach it to you. It's in his word. We're not making anything up here. It's in black and white. Now it does say, and is baptized. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I don't want to. Uh, the Church of Christ is wrong, okay? Have a nice day. Or, excuse me, they said it on the TV this morning. The churches of Christ is wrong. The scripture doesn't say anything against the one who's not baptized. It does say if you believe not. It doesn't say if you're baptized not. Okay? I'm pretty sure that thief that was on the cross with Jesus Christ was not baptized. And yet today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So if you want to, you can just take that whole thing and just chuck it out. Now, I am not against baptism in any way, shape, or form. And I will tell you this, because it's easy, it's in the scripture. The like figure whereunto even bath, baptism doth also now save us. Whew. Ooh. But yeah, keep reading. There's a little parenthesis here, this is just perfect. It's like Peter knew they were going to do this. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, how in the world do you get a good conscience before God? Believe his son. Believe his son. Believe his son. What? By the resurrection of Christ. Believe his son. Baptism shows forth the belief in the resurrected Christ that was talking to these 11 men right here. Now, baptism is not necessary for salvation. But if you believe him, be baptized. Be baptized. By one who preaches the gospel. Right. Because you want to know what gospel you're confessing. Which Christ you're confessing. You know? Now just for argument's sake, I can tell you how. How we fallen, depraved creatures do believe him. Because Jesus told us how. More than once, but I'm only going to one. It's John 6 and verse 29. And I love this verse too. I can't help it. Well, John 6 and verse 28. This was Christ speaking with some people. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? This is the question asked Christ. And I just heard Earl this morning on tape saying... You know, pay attention to the questions in the scripture and look because usually you'll get the answer. It might not be the answer that those people get that they wanted, 
but you'll get the answer because you're going to get Christ's answer here. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God. Okay, now you just stop right there for just a minute. You better pay attention. There are several, what I call this is is. I know it's bad English. There's several times in the book of John where you'll read this is this. This is eternal life. This is, well here, this is the work of God. If you want to know what the work of God is here, read on because the Son of God is fixing to tell us. I don't have to speculate. I don't have to interpret. This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. I don't think that's the answer they were looking for. But that's the answer of Jesus Christ. Mm, I like that. I do. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means exactly what it says. Now, is this... Yeah, I wrote this down so I wouldn't mess it up. Now, is this the work that we are to do? Or is this a work of God in us that we believe? Ooh, these are my favorite questions. Yes. The answer is yes. I love that. Yeah, it's the work of God. Start with that one. Because that's what Christ said. This is the work of God. Now they wanted to know what they could do for the works of God. Christ told them what the work of God is. That you believe. It takes a work of God for you to believe him. And it is your work to believe him. You can have it both ways. Because if you only got it one way, it ain't right. Because if you've got it one way, you're going to have it the other. If you believe him, it's because he's worked in you. And if he's worked in you, you're going to believe him. That tells you how we believe. And I'm going to tell you now, I think I got figured out the why I believe. Okay? This is a, have you ever asked yourself, why do I believe? Why? I have to. Walter, I have no choice in the matter. I have to believe him. I know it's hard, and, to, and it's kind of a hard concept, and I don't know if I can relate it, but I'm going to do my best. I believe because he has made me a believer. Yes. Yes. Just in the same way that I sin because I'm a sinner. Right. I can't help it. That's right. And I'm going to tell you something. I can't help but believe in him. That's the truth. Yeah. That's the truth. This is the work of God that ye believe him. Believe the Son of God. And that is the gospel. I don't quite understand it, even after all these years, but I know this is where I am. And this is what I do. I believe him. See, people get so wound up and say, well, if I, were, if I, if I believe that the way you did, I wouldn't know what to do. Well, great. That's actually not a bad place to be in. Yeah, exactly. That's progress. But see, here's the whole thing. If he said it, I believe it, whether I understand it or not. Understanding is not called for here. He said, he that believes shall be saved. Understanding will come. He will give you understanding. There is a growth in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's as real a thing as he that believeth, the same shall be saved. That's just the facts. 
But here's the other fact. He that believes not. That's right there with it. He that believes not. Guess what? This is also a result of preaching. He that believes and he that believes not. That's the only two grounds. There's no neutral territory in the middle. Well, I'm waiting to make my decision. That's hooey. You don't believe. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Walter, in some cases, there ain't no fence to sit on. <laughs> Walter has a saying about fence sitting that I'm not going to bring up here. <laughs> There ain't no fence to sit on here. You either believe or you don't. Right. Yeah. And what will show it is the preaching of the gospel. Because it says of those who preach the gospel, and that includes these apostles, that includes everybody since then, Charles Spurgeon, myself, Walter, Earl Cochran, every preacher, okay? We are the savor of life unto life to those that believe. And we, it says we, are the savor of death unto death to those who don't believe. What's the difference? He that believes and he that believes not. This is a result of every sermon that's ever been preached. This is where it is. Go back to John 3.18 again. He that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he doesn't believe in the only begotten Son of God. He doesn't believe him. That's what it is. You either believe him or you believe not him. You ain't got to believe me. You do have to believe this. This is his word. And if you do believe, you will believe this. But it's not what you know, it's who you know. Amen. And if you know him, he'll fix the what you know. I'm not going to go into the rest of this so much at all. Other than the fact that I will tell you this. There was such a thing as apostolic power. Sure. Yeah. There was. was. And I said was because I mean was. We don't have apostolic power now. I would like to have it. <laughs> I'll be honest. <clears throat> but there's probably a real good reason I don't. I don't know if you could actually abuse apostolic power, but if I there was a way, I'd probably try and find it. There are some people I would like to give boils to. I'm sorry. I can't help it. I repent, but then I'll do it again. And taking up serpents, y'all, <laughs> don't do that. Okay? This is not a command to take up serpents and get bit with them. I don't know if y'all know about the people down in Jolo. There's a church. There was a church down there. I don't know if they're still alive or not. They, that's what they do. They're snake handlers. Okay? Okay? That's not what this is talking about. Okay? Jesus Christ was not commanding us to get a snake and put it in a box and save it for next Sunday. There is a very valid illustration in Acts where Paul was bit by a venomous serpent. And it bit him on the hand. But Paul didn't put it in a sack and save it for next Sunday. Or take it down to, he didn't go down to the water where snakes was wanting to be handled. He went down where prayer was wanted to be made. And he took that snake that was in his hand and he shook it off in the fire. In the fire. Because that's what you do with a venomous beast. You don't hang around with it and play with it. Because, you know, Jesus Christ said to the devil... When he said, why don't you just jump off here and the angels will keep you from dashing your foot. He said, it is written again that thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's what it is. Okay. God protected his apostles, these 11. And others. 
But I'm going to tell you something. Don't jump out in front of a bus and think God will save you. He may save you, but he may leave you in the hospital for a while. Exactly. These were apostolic powers. They're not my powers. And they're not yours. And the apostolic powers are gone, but the command still stands, go and preach the gospel. That part still stands. We are to continue in the apostolic what? doctrine. Not the apostolic miracles. He gives them signs. It says why. They went forth and preached everywhere. It says that first. And the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. This was for the establishment of the church. The church is established now. We've got his word here in written form. In black and white and sometimes the words of Christ in red. We have his word. The church is established. Those things are gone. But we are still to go and preach the gospel. And guess what? We still have the same results. Paul said it. Well, no, not Paul. I guess Luke wrote it in Acts 24 and verse 28. And he was writing of Paul's preaching. Some believed the things that were spoken, and some believed not. So my request to you is, believe Christ. This is the one thing, okay? Believing not is the one thing here that can be changed. You understand? Saul heard Stephen preach the gospel and was consenting unto his death. He didn't believe then. And if you look at this, I, I, I had never noticed this before, but it says some believed. Um, wait a minute, no, not that part. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. That believeth is not actually believes. It's he that believed. It's in past tense, in the aorist tense. But it says he shall be saved in the future. Guess what? He that believed, that's past tense, shall be damned. That can change. One day, I didn't believe Walter, and another day I did. Now, once you believe, you're not ever going to not believe. I will never leave thee. I will never, I will never forsake thee. That's right. He brings you in and he keeps you in. We are kept by the power of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We believe him. But the believe not part, that can change. It takes the work of God. But that's what he's doing. It's his work. Take heart in that. Take heart in that. I know some people here that when I first met them, they weren't believers. But I think they're believers now. And I'd like to know some more. I'd like to know some more. But this is the result of the preaching the gospel. He that believeth shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And that's where it lies. Our Father, thank you for this time and this place. Lord, most of all, thank you for your Son, in whom, by whom, you have given us all things in this world. Thank you, Lord. Be with Walter as he comes and gives your message this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen.